Hey everyone, and welcome to the Roofer Masterclass here. Uh, excited to have everybody in here right now. Uh, do us a favor, drop your uh, location in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, let us know. Be happy to chat. Um, as you see, we've got a bit of a different lineup today. We have the world's greatest roofer here, TJ McCormick. Uh, really What's excited. going on, guys? We're excited going, to have Jake? you aboard. Doing well, man. Doing well. Excited. We got uh, uh, TJ, of course, is our community uh, manager here for Roofer. And uh, we couldn't think of a better person to bring in for this topic here on how to uh, how new companies can uh, get out there in a competitive market. So really you excited to chat about that today and uh, get into it. Love seeing everybody in the chat already. Got a bunch of people from uh, all over. Hey, TJ, you got uh, someone from Denver, right? What's now. up, Phil? How's it going, man? I see you, man. Thank you so much for the messages yesterday. Phil, Phil's been a friend for many years here in the Denver market, um, especially when I was out grinding and hustling those roofs. And, uh, man, it's, it's great to see all of these people engaging in the comments. As everybody, well, if you don't know who I am, uh, I'm world's greatest roofer on social media. And one of the things that I teach roofing companies uh, the very first thing I teach is engagement and how to uh, how to be better uh, at social media. And man, it's great to see Seattle, Little Rock, Michigan. Wow, you guys uh, you guys are crushing it already. Coming from all over, which is amazing. So yeah. that, that actually brings us to like the perfect thing to open up with. Yeah. Uh, you you and I have had our experiences in roofing companies. Of course, uh, anybody who's been to these master classes before has heard about me starting out with my dad and helping him run his uh, uh, a company uh, just north of Toronto here. And yeah. for TJ, why don't you give a little bit of background on, on your roofing yeah. history as well? Yeah, sure. So um, just over you know 20 years ago, I, I was doing some little stuff here and there. I, I was a police officer uh, for many years of my, my uh, big beginning part of my adult life. But during my off time, I worked for my father-in-law building piers and seawalls and then also boathouses. Um, so I got my my shingling in and that those days. Uh, but really, truly, uh, my, my start in the roofing industry was in 2015. Uh, I was working for a company back then called Mad Sky, and I was their national recruiter and educator uh, for roofing companies that were coming into our program. Um, and uh, a couple of years after being there, I decided that I was training so many 21 year olds to go out and make a million dollars or sell a million dollars a year that I actually wanted to get in on that action and make some of that money myself. Uh, uh, I, I tell people often I'm a storm chaser for life. I've come from the insurance side of, uh, of roofing um, and then I stayed in that storm chaser model uh, into large loss as well as into uh, into residential sales. Uh, and then also uh, working at every level of a roofing company from production to sales to marketing uh, to hustling myself uh, for many years of uh, roofing systems. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, just over uh, almost nine years in the industry now. Um, and then as roofers community manager, I'm still out teaching roofing companies uh, and then also raising awareness of, of topics and trends that are happening in our industry. That's amazing. And uh, one of the things that you've seen a lot from uh, um, helping companies out with their socials and, and, and sitting down and teaching them how to kind of get out there is small to medium sized businesses, right? Yeah, yeah. usually it's a it's a startup of somehow or even all the way up. A, I've taught a company this year that's 40 million dollars. Um, and uh, so I've gotten to see just about every walk of life in the roofing industry from that roofer who's sitting in their truck, possibly right now watching us on a master on this master class. But that truck is their office. Right. And uh, they're the ones answering the call. They're the ones inputting all the stuff into their system. Uh, and then all the way to these guys that have 20 or 30 office workers uh, or people uh, behind the scenes that are doing things for them. That's amazing. And wh yeah. what would you say some of the similarities are between a company just starting out? Because this is something mm -hmm. that I, I always think about that companies just starting mm -hmm. out think that, oh, that big company in my market, that's where I want to get to. We're so different. Yeah. But yeah. there's so many similarities between the two. What are some of the things that you've seen that kind of connects those? 
Yeah, you know, um, it used to be back in the old days, uh, even I'm going to predate myself prior to the internet, you know, where, where people were having to use the newspaper, maybe they were having to use uh, the, the yellow pages in the United States. I don't know if you guys have the yellow pages in Canada, uh, but we, there was not a lot of uh, opportunity for marketing outside of, uh, of the normal way of marketing now. A lot of the things that I see now in regards to those uh, to those newer companies as well as those older companies is that they're they're able to brand and position themselves a lot higher than uh, than back in the old days because social media is so fast. It's in the moment right now. Uh, you can literally go out and make a video or a post where maybe a million people might see it over the next few hours. Uh, but the, the roofing companies are competing now uh, at that level where one might be a $40 million company, but the other one is still trying to get to their first million in sales. Uh, it's all in how they're positioning so themselves in, in that, that branding, uh, in that marketing, and then how well they're, they're growing their company. Amazing. Yeah. It's uh, it's cool to see what we can do nowadays. Like, a, like yeah. you'd have to always. I remember watching my dad's company and my mom always talking with like yellow pages and stuff, trying to get the advertising out. And then when it jumped to the internet age, you got to look at SEO. You got to look at yeah. rankings on Google. You got to look at all the different ways. And yeah. it really has opened up the door for contractors of all sizes to kind of take a piece of the pie. Yeah. It really has, uh, you know, um, you know, a good Google uh, SEO, is, it takes about six months to a year before you start seeing those good leads coming in. Uh, but if, you, if you're starting now, uh, I recommend jumping into that with your marketing agency or if you understand how that works, uh, getting going immediately so that you can start ranking higher in the Google listings. Uh, and then also, um, I also recommend that you get started on your social media right now, like don't wait for it. Don't wait until you've been in business a year. You can grow your business right now, today, on social media, just by being consistent every day. Uh, that's the same thing with your Google. As long as you're vlogging, as long as you're blogging, uh, you're keeping your website clean, and you're, you're giving all of the things that a homeowner or a business owner might need. Uh, it, it's really full circle in regards to how the algorithms are working uh, whether it be the internet or social media. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool to see um, how you can kind of consistently get out there. And one of the benefits that I have working with roofer and talking to roofers every day is like on the sales side is I get to see how many companies are just starting fresh. Like yep, even yep. in the company, uh, in, in the comments here, we're seeing people that just started uh, three months ago, 18 years in the industry just past the three year, started this year, expanding to new cities. All that stuff is really, really cool because we get to talk to them and see where mm -hmm. they are going, what their goals are, and how are they trying to get there. Yeah. So I, I'm going to bring this back to something that I saw you post on social this week that was, was awesome engagement, yeah. a lot of great stories, is companies just starting out are always worried about making mistakes. Yep. And they're always worried about, I don't want to fall into the same trap. So they're always looking at what other companies have done. And you made a post yeah. this uh, this uh, week saying, what are some of the mistakes you made during a roofing company that you wish you wouldn't have done? Yeah. It, um, it, that, that post, uh, by the way, guys, um, I didn't ever expect to have that much engagement on a post like that before. <laughs> um, it, you know, like, uh, a, a lot of people know me for being some sort of viral, uh, at most times of my life. Uh, but when, when it comes to written posts or thought posts, uh, it's typically, uh, not that much engagement, but in the past, uh, in the past few days, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of people that wish that they could have uh, could have done something different in uh, in their roofing company, um, from whether or not it, it be uh, having uh, no partners, uh, or maybe having enough capital for uh, supplies. Uh, there's been so many stories. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that no partners thing. It, you, just always be careful with who you go in business with. And one of the things that Pete's always talked about, and we I talk about it in in, in uh, uh, our, our, our 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 trade shows, that's the word we're talking about, with the breakout sessions, is having your process written down on paper. Yeah, I think it's a really good activity to do if you are looking to partner with someone. Both of you guys go or girls, 
go off to different sides, write down your ideals, your, your, your goals for the company, how you want to achieve them and bring it in. If you guys are diametrically opposed, then it's, it might not be the best thing because you're just going to butt heads. Now you don't want to just be completely alike and thinking the same way because you're not going to be able to grow and challenge each other that way. But always be careful with who you're getting in bed with business, right? You know, um, I, I, I'm going to be, I, I'll be open and vulnerable about my, my business, right? I own a company myself, besides working at Roofer, I own a company called World's Greatest Roofer. And uh, when I went into business just over a year ago with my girlfriend, Karina, I was having some really, uh, some, some headaches and some thoughts about what if, what if, what if, you know, and uh, still like uh, at any time, if we ever decided that we didn't want to be together, it could be a, a messy breakup in our business as well as our personal life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those are just things that I think of uh, in regards to um, how is it going to look on social? How's it going to look in the community? Uh, how is that partner going to talk about you? And you have to be married to that person. Uh, and you guys have to be firing on all the same cylinders to be working together. Uh, it's, it's great working with the partnerships team here at Roofer because I get to see a different side of, of how those relationships are built. But I also have seen many roofing companies fail because, uh, one, money and greed, uh, but two, uh, control. Um, and uh, you, you have to be able to control your roofing company if you're uh, a good leader. And uh, sometimes uh, we, we fall out of, uh, out of sync with each other if we're in a partnership with one another. Um, and and I'll, I'll relate that to trends, right? People are trending. Uh, just because right now, uh, for example, maybe today I might like red wine. But six months from now, I might change and I might like white wine. Uh, and, uh, or let's use a roofing analogy. Maybe today I like certain teeth, but six months from now, I like GAF, right? Uh, you have to be able to trend with that partner, uh, or there you're going to trend apart and then the business is going to break up. Yeah. It's a really good point in, in not kind of, I always, I see it sometimes on, uh, on not just roofing social media, but just social media in general, where someone will bash a company a manufacturer a product or something like that and then six months later you see them loving that and being like you're just like it's so transparent yeah so know know that things can change products update things uh, 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 will evolve and yeah. make sure that you can evolve too because if you kind of hook your horse to one wagon and something mm-hmm. happens you want to be able to be able to kind of pivot on that on that move let, let me go back to, if you don't mind, for just yeah. a second to something we were just speaking about in the very beginning, which was being process driven, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I'm so sad that Pete's not be able to be here with us today. The process guy. Uh, Pete the process guy, right? Wow. But, but one That's of the new things nickname, that, uh, Pete the process. <laughs> <laughs> process Pete. You know what? Uh, talking with uh, our partners and other people, I always refer to Pete as process Pete. You don't know process Pete? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but going back to that, let me talk to, uh, uh, to everyone everybody about that. Like uh, there's people out in the industry right now, uh, like uh, Jessica, right? Um, from Ignite Results. Uh, and then also uh, Christopher Scoville. Everybody knows Chris Scoville from Blue Pages Pro. These guys are always preaching process, process, process. And, and you know what? And in the very beginning of working inside of roofing companies, I didn't quite understand what that meant. Today, I'm here to tell you, I know what that means. And, and those processes from start to finish, it doesn't, it, I, I call it the peanut butter and jelly sandwich analogy, right? Everything that you do on a day-to-day basis has a process. And back when we were in elementary school, we had this process called a peanut butter and jelly. How do you build a peanut butter and jelly? And everybody's interpretation is different. But as a business owner, your interpretation of how this process is supposed to work uh, to the letter or to the T uh, and, and everything that you do uh, can help your business grow because you're being repeatable uh, and you're not just making things up as you go. Yeah, it's, it's huge. And, and that's one of the things in those breakout sessions that uh, we do is talking about, can you write or have you written your process out on paper? Yeah. Because if it's too, too kind of granular, you're going to lose people in the process. You're going to lose some things there. If it's too broad, you're going to be leaving things out and you're going to be missing things. So creating that process is around five to eight steps long. You could have checklists within those processes, 
but making sure that you have those things set up. So new lead comes in, you have pre-appointment inspection, you have the uh, actual quoting portion, the follow-up, the sale, the pr production, post-production, and then ultimately uh, invoicing payment slash review. There's yep. a great there. And being able to set that up and having steps throughout there to make sure that things are done properly. But creating a process at the beginning of your company and making sure you have that on paper so you can import it into whatever you're doing down the line, whether it be a CRM or anything else, is something that is imperative to ensure your success, ensure that you guys are streamlined. Because yeah. you, you know from the social media world, it takes one bad review to just tank you. Yeah, it does. Um, you're exactly right. Um, one of the things that I saw many years ago when I first got started in this portion of the industry, I was training roofing companies um, who were from the storm chasing model, right? And a lot of those guys and girls uh, would come to uh, our program and they would have had just, uh, or they have just had a hailstorm in their market. And so they rush out and they hire a bunch of warm bodies of, of people, salespeople, and they don't ever train them, right? Uh, on the process of what it, what it takes to uh, call a homeowner from the second that you get that lead uh, to like what you're talking about, pre-inspection checklist, showing up at the person's house, how to show up at their house 10 minutes prior, parking on the side of the street, not blocking the driveway, the little things, right? Uh, and then getting into the inspection process, even inspecting a house, you should have a process, especially when it comes to hail damage, uh, in the retail market, possibly you're getting a call out to go out and inspect a roof, maybe a gutter leak, maybe there's a fascia or a soffit leak uh, or, or another type of repair. And, and you also need to have a process for that. But when you're talking about inspecting a house from the ground up uh, or even production, make sure that you're writing how you want it done and you can tweak it at any time. But when your people come in and they need something or they want to learn how you did it, it's already written and it, uh, the, the Bible's not having to be rewritten. And then if they're not following the steps, it's time for re-education. And that's a big thing too. Like, are you a process-driven company or a results-driven company? Right. And what we see so often out there, and unfortunately we see it more so in the restoration world than we do in the retail world, is you're very much a results-driven company. Yeah. But when those results dry up, what are you? Are you able to, right. no pun intended, weather the storm? Yeah. Like, are, are you able to do that? Because we've seen it so many times, like in where you are in Colorado, you guys have had a big hailstorm in a couple of years now, right? Yeah. We're, we're a retail market now. Yeah. We're, we're, we're no longer a storm market. And Denver uh, has been notorious as the hail capital of the world for many years. Mm -hmm. And here we are sitting with no hail. And that's the thing. If you don't have that process in place, how many of those companies, unfortunately, did you see in your area pack up shop? So uh, great, great uh, or great topic here. I was talking with Justin Dant the other day. Justin Dant is the owner of Soderberg Roofing up in northern Colorado. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been around in the industry about as long as Justin's company has been around. And we were talking about just this topic and, and how different it's become. Um, when COVID happened um, here in Colorado, we had roughly 450 roofing companies uh, at the start of 2020. By the end of 2020, we had a half of that. And then because we haven't had hail, it's possible that we have less than 100 roofing companies here in Colorado at this moment. Because like you said, when there's no results or no sales, there's no company. And if you don't understand how not to be a storm chaser and also how to be a retail store, a retail uh, salesperson, then you're not going to be able to sell uh, because retail is 100% harder than uh, insurance sales all day, every day. I, I, you guys out there that are selling retail jobs and good, a great praise to you guys, because I know how hard it is. Uh, the finance model or, or the asking for money from somebody who might not have it is, is really tough. Yeah, it's uh, ch check out our financing podcast with Chris Scoville uh, last uh, week. It's up on YouTube right now, too. It was a really good, good content there. But I'll, I'll mention this because I, I, I might see I'm thinking in the chat. I'm just picturing this. All the retail roofers in here being like, that's right. That's right. But I'd be, I would pause and just say process driven and results driven does not just 
apply to storm restoration sure. because we're running into something where results driven is going to dry up for a little bit for us retail roofers too. So yeah. it's kind of nice. We have the dichotomy here. You're, you're from the store market, I'm from the retail, but yeah. here's what's going to happen with the retail roofers. And this is why as he, uh, TJ was mentioning there, diversify your offerings in the store market, make yeah. sure that you can get a good retail offering as well as a good uh, uh, insurance offering. But the yeah, same yeah. thing in retail roofing. We're running into a recession right now that is going to be an issue. We're yeah, already yeah. seeing it with high interest rates. We're already seeing it with issues with people wanting to buy roofs. Up in Toronto, Canada, I'm, I was just at a trade show last week. And everybody, suppliers, manufacturers, roofers and stuff were saying, yeah, it's a little bit quieter this year. It's quieter to start of the season. There's still work. At the end of the day, guys, we're roofers. Roofing is a recession-proof industry because... Yeah roofs need to be done. It's covering your house. But what you need to do if you're a re retail roofer is start looking at that diversifying your offerings again. Number one, starting with financing. You should always be offering financing. And like you saw, in, if, if you watch that last masterclass, is every customer is a snowflake. They're all different FICO scores and credit scores. So you should be offering a multitude of different financing products to apply to each person. But also look into diversifying your offerings as a... Um, uh, as a, uh, um, a retail person for installations. So look yeah. into roof rejuvenation, look into coatings for flat roofing and, and everything else. Look into a being able to offer something as like a, a, a extra add on, like a gutters or fascia or something like that. And yeah. making sure that you're out there so that you can get jobs always and that you're always that neighborhood roofer. And the, we'll go back to process Pete here, maintenance. Maintenance, yeah, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Mm -hmm. That is the easiest way to make sure that you are that neighborhood roofer, that your name's in there because you keep on coming back there. It's a recurring revenue. You got some MRR uh, for all your SaaS lovers out there to get that information in. So whether you're retail or restoration, make sure that you are setting yourself up with process as well as making sure that you have a good diversifying of products so that you're ready for anything. You, you know, um, a couple of years ago, one of the things that I did in the industry, I, I was really big into the solar industry. A lot of people might remember that. Some people might not. Um, but I was uh, really interested in getting uh, roofs financed using tax credits and things like that. But since uh, I'm not actually working in the solar side of it, uh, having a finance company on your side, even though it's an insurance claim, is still something that you can do. Uh, there's a lot of homeowners right now that that might be able to take uh, and put that money in their pocket or do other upgrades by still financing a storm claim. Uh, and uh, it's it it was really great for those commercial business owners who might have needed a little bit of capital, especially during uh, COVID um, in in financing a roof, maybe five, 10, 15 years uh, and then taking that insurance money and reinvesting it back into their company. Uh, I'm not saying to do it all the time. I know that it's very legal to do so. But the, also one of the things that's coming out of the storm market is that there's a lot of people out there that can't afford to pay their, their deductibles on those storm claims right now. And mm -hmm. as you know, in, in Texas, they have three to 5% deductibles on the value of a home. So if it's a $300,000 home, they're might having to pay $9,000, $12,000 just to get their roof. Yeah. Anybody out there experiencing high deductibles or, or things uh, in regards to interest rates um, uh, that that might be uh, not so appetizing to a homeowner? And and so. the, put some no notes in the comments, guys. And yeah. it, it, it's a great point because we saw after Irma. So that's when I got my exposure to to American restoration roofing because we uh, we don't have the same type up in Canada, but. We saw after Irma, it was a gold rush yeah, and yeah. a lot of people took advantage to it. And unfortunately, I, I was sitting back and taking a look at everything and being like, this is crazy. This is a lot of money. But I'm looking at it from an outside perspective, being like, those insurance companies aren't going to stand for that that long. A lot yeah. of people are like, no, this is going to give that keeps on giving. Right. But now we're seeing RCVs are gone. For the most yeah. part, ACV is typically what you're dealing with now. And those ACV deductibles are almost as much as a new roof. Yeah. So it's important to look into being able to finance and finding that right finance partner that is going to uh, help out with being able to 
able to finance a deductible. So you got to yeah. check that out there. I, I saw one question in there asking about some good finance companies yeah. in there. Um, check out if you're in Canada, uh, finance it and snap. If you're in the United States, it got Mosaic, Service Finance, Goodleap. Uh, Goodleap, by the way, is directly integrated with Roofer. So you could apply for financing directly into that proposal. So hit us up yeah. at roofer.com. Uh, also, you got, uh, uh, um, uh, I just lost it, Mosaic, Goodleap, yeah. uh, Service Finance, and then also Moment is a really good one as well. Yeah, and then uh, there's there's other companies out there that can help as well, like Fund My Deductible, um, and, and then also, you know, the banks uh, that are out there, like what you're talking about right now um, has happened to me in my sales career in roofing. Uh, right after Ida, I was in Louisiana, right? And I learned something about uh, that portion of what you're talking about right now. Uh, hurricanes have been hitting the United States for many, many years. Uh, but we're seeing quite a bit of uh, legislation coming out of Florida as well as Louisiana in regards to that. But when I was down there in, in Louisiana after Ida, there were many, many thousands of people that don't have insurance on their home any longer because insurance won't even won't even work together with them. Yeah. So they were trying to figure out how to get a new roof on their house after not having insurance. Now, going into you know the retail side of things, you know, being able to have those financing options or even understanding how financing works is the difference between uh, having a sales or, or a roofing company or not having a business at all. Because if you're not able to get your customers money, if they don't have any, then you don't have a business like we were saying earlier. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a big, big difference there. So really making sure that you could diversify those offerings, making sure that you can help out because ultimately, guys, we're here to make money. But yep. we're here to help out that homeowner. And the more you help out that homeowner, the bigger your name gets, the better the referrals you get, and you become that growing company, which leads me back to exactly where uh, we were uh, with the mistakes that you made in the first year uh, of your yep. roofing company. Was there any other ones that kind of stood out to you uh, for that? Yes. Um, taking on too many trades that I didn't, uh, one, didn't understand um fully uh on how to properly assess the damage or maybe properly assess how much it's going to be uh, to get it done and then also having the subcontracting crews or the uh, in-house uh, laborers who understand how those trades work as well um when when i got into business i i started off as a general contractor so i was taking on every trade i was wrong for doing so uh, because I didn't understand how siding worked, how windows worked. Uh, and, you know, I, I understood, uh, understood real well roof and gutters, but those other trades, I saw dollar signs before I, before I actually understood uh, how to make real money from them. Yeah, it, it's, 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 uh, I see that a lot. Not only that, that and uh, I see that a lot with people just kind of opening up everything, just like yeah. an entire exteriors company and they, not great at siding but they're good at roofing or they're not good at roofing but they're good at gutters like yeah. that kind of stuff really help creates a, a, a bad taste in people's mouth because if you're not able to do it properly that's all it takes is just one bad review to kind of sewer you the other thing i see that's really big is if you're in one of those companies where you started off and you're like a rocket out of a spaceship you're just yeah. you guys are killing it you guys are crushing it and they're like hey man this this is easy i almost swore there uh, the roofer in me almost came out. So. Uh, but like this S is easy. Like we're ready to rock and roll here. Let's keep it moving. Um, let's expand. Let's grow. Let's get into a new market. And yep. you just see that all the time, especially yep. uh, when we're working in Florida and stuff like that. They're like, I'm in Jacksonville. I'm killing it. Let's get down to Gainesville and Tampa. And yep. they're not ready for it. They don't have the no. capital for it. They don't have the process or the systems in place. And they expand and they either close up altogether or those two locations go down and they have some reviews they got to work out on. So being well, very self-aware is very important too. I was going to say something about that too just now because that brings me to another point. Uh, we, we can come back to Amanda in just a minute. Amanda, I see your comment there. Um, but uh, money services uh, in your business planning you need to figure that out like before you open up day one, Amanda, I think I saw you speaking about money services the other day on one of your posts on Facebook. Um, but being able to cash checks, being able to get money when you need it, 
um, when banks hold your money. Uh, and then also when you're waiting for that cash flow to come in, if you're from a storm market or, or even a retail market, when you're waiting for those banks to release the different uh, amounts of money, you might have to pay your laborers. You might have to pay your supply bills. And if you are locked up or you don't have the funding to do so, you've already drowned your business. So many roofers go out of business because they don't pay their supply bills their first year. Yeah. And uh, in working together with those roofers now, I understand the challenges because you're waiting on, uh, for example, an insurance company to pay out, but you built the roof six months ago. Uh, but you have to be ready for all of those financial situations to be able to pay your workers, to pay your sales guys, uh, and then also pay for permitting and, and all of the other things that come with running a roofing company. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy the uh, amount that's in there. But I, I do want to get to Amanda's comment there. Amanda, you're always great with your insight. Uh, Amanda's, by the way, just follow her on Facebook. She's got great yeah. information. Always good questions. Good. I heard good she's questions. an okay marketer. Yeah, she's 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 got a <laughs> so, but uh, she she writes in the comments there. How do you feel about partnering with a competitor who does another service line really really well, so you can focus on your niche? Yep. My opinion, I'll, I'll and I'll let you jump in there. Yeah. Hundred and twenty percent. Yes, yeah. I think that the relationships that you build locally is paramount to growing your company. And that yeah. means playing nice with your foes, your friends, your enemies, everything. You want to make sure that your competitors are your best friends there. And if you know someone out there that is really good, I'm going to use my dad as a perfect example. My dad's a great metal worker. He, that's how he started in the industry. Then he got into roofing and flat roofing. Uh, but for gutters, he's great. I've, done, I've hung so much gutters with him. And we yeah. have our own machine and everything built into the back of the truck. But on big jobs, he knows that there's one guy out there that is no better than there's, there's better than everybody else. And that's yeah. his friend, Rod. He's got a competing co a contracting company out there. And guess what? On every single job, he uses Rod. And, and every roofing job, Rod uses him. And yep. that's how you can kind of create some shared business and building it up. But on that same point, a big mistake that a lot of small companies do when they're growing is when you're subbing off someone. And I just heard this uh, last week at our shingle and mingle up in Toronto. When you're subbing off someone and that person then has another portion of work that they want to do and they might ask you because you're the person out yeah. there, be sure not to burn that bridge. And if they ask you to do yeah. that job, you go back to that person. You yep. want to keep those relationships tight because those are the people that are going to help you get to the next level. You know, um, yeah, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll even say 200 percent, you know, like uh, I think Radford said the other day, people make up percentages just to make them sound good. Right. I think yeah. it's like a million percent. Right. Uh, yeah. um, but, but yes, no, um, you should be out there networking with your competitors in every market, no matter if it's painting, uh, fencing, uh, whatever the exterior trade might be you need their help because when you go to that homeowner to do a project, you're going to see some other things that are going on with that residence or that business that you aren't an expert in. Uh, and you know that possibly like somebody else can assist you in that. Here's something I say quite frequently when I hear people talk about competition and roofing companies, there's 2.3 billion roofs in the world. Not any of us in, in the many hundreds of thousands of roofers that are out there will ever roof 2.3 billion roofs in our lifetime. Um, so in your market, yes, uh, you know, in your local market, there's going to be people that, that possibly are doing better than you. But you are the, the, you're the one that's driving that truck and you can also be better as well. And you're going to grow over time. Uh, but also, yes, please go out there, get as many people that can work together with you. Uh, but yeah, don't burn your subs and don't burn your partners uh, or people that um, are doing right by you. Um, if they give you a roof, give them a siding job. If they give you gutters, give them what, you know, if, they, if they're if they doing a barter deal with you, then make sure you always do right by them. So it's like, it's extra points, right? Like yeah. you can get points, like socially points. That's not what I meant, but also yeah. that works. But also you get points on the job. So you're sharing that out. And then what gets you that better referral, that better uh, communication, winning those jobs and everything, then helping that customer with multiple needs. Today, we roofer hasn't done roofs in four, three years now. Yeah. 
I got a text from a client that we did a roof for four years ago. And he's like, hey, do you know any uh, uh, masonry guys? I want to get some landscaping done. I was like, yeah, I do actually. Sent him two numbers. I'm not expecting any points from it. Yeah. I'm just that that kind of relationship continues. Mm-hmm. And now he's going to sing the praises of roofer. He's going to like this person help me out even with a non roofing job. So yeah. those things make a big difference when you're becoming that neighborhood roofer, that five mile famous, that whatever kind of phrase that we want to bring around there that's how you become that dominant person in your market. And that's actually where I want to go next. And and I don't think there's anybody better here to talk about this than TJ McCormick here, but becoming and growing your company. Yeah. I always say you start where you live. Yep. You don't try to grow too big. You become that neighborhood roofer. You became that name and that's how you grow. So tell us how to get there. Yeah. So, um, you know, thank you for leading into that. Um, and I know that there's some people here that are, that know who I am um, and know how I've grown on social media in regards to generating uh, my own leads or generating leads for other people from from whether it be residential to be commercial. Also, also uh, in regards to recruiting, um, recruiting is one of my strongest points when it comes to social. But, uh, you know, a few years back, um, I'll say like 2016, 2017, uh, a lot of people remember those days when a, a company called Crest, right? Crest was out there every day on social media and they were, they were promoting Crest Hustle, right? And, and they were getting up on roofs and they were taking a picture of themselves with a selfie and, uh, and they were posting it online and they were like, hey, if you need a free estimate, call us. Well, people were reaching out to them. And there were lots of people reaching out to them because they were putting themselves out there, showing themselves actually doing the work that they say that they were going to do. And then they were showing the uh, the completed project at the end, which was giving homeowners, business owners and, and other types of people uh, the understanding that they could be trusted to get that job done. Now, let's fast forward to 2020. 2020 happened. Uh, I go to Grant Cardone's 10X. I recommend it to anybody. Uh, I go to 10X and uh, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of my house during lockdown, right? Uh, We had uh, in Colorado here, we're in a very liberal place uh, and they really liked to lock us down quite a bit. And unless you were an essential employee with a job to go to, you couldn't really leave your house. I mean, nobody was going to stop you, but you couldn't just walk up to somebody's house and go door knock on their door during the middle of COVID. There was people just weren't allowing that to happen. Um, But what I'm getting at is, is I started learning how to do social media on my own. Uh, I, I came up with a cool, catchy name, world's greatest roofer, you know, uh, and and it, it was great. People out there are trying to distinguish themselves as somebody different in the marketplace. Uh, And you know what? I came up with a a good catchphrase uh, for for my title for social media. Now, what that did in turn is as I was learning how to create seven to 30 second videos of me uh, and branding myself as world's greatest roofer was that there were people out there that were willing to watch me live or even in videos consistently without slamming the door in my face like a door knocker or a lead generator might have if they're calling a homeowner and they're like, no, we're not interested. But instead, at seven o'clock at night, when people were sitting down on their couch after eating dinner or spending time with their family, they were watching my content consistently and people were reaching out in the hundreds and thousands saying, yes, I want you to come and inspect my roof. I want you to come out and give me a price on this roof. Yes, we want you to be our roofer. It, the, it was overwhelming. But going back to being five mile famous, now every single time that I still go to the grocery store today, I live in Southeast Aurora, Colorado, which is just Southeast of Denver. And people recognize me in the grocery store every time I go. Like, it's like, oh, hey, world's greatest roofer. I'm like, who the hell is that person, right? But because I was putting myself on camera in the local market, tagging Aurora, Colorado every single time, like people re- recognize me and I was able to build trust using social as that gateway for me. Uh, and, and you guys can do the same. I hope we get into that in just a moment. 
Yeah, it's uh, it, it's an amazing thing to kind of build that out. Um, like again, I'm gonna plug my dad, but like there's a local Facebook group in his area. There's a, it's a large area north of Toronto, and every time someone says, "Hey, do you guys know roofing or gutters or anything like that?" Yeah. It's it's overwhelmingly my dad because he's a neighborhood roofer. Guess what? He hasn't really had to expand before. Yeah. He's been working around that same area, building up that information. And and you can do the same too. And it's important to become a part of the community. And we've talked about it before on po- uh, podcasts and masterclasses with uh, Process Pete, which he will now forever be known as uh, <laughs> Process Pete and myself. We talked about uh, Ty Backer, uh, yeah. uh, Ty, TC Backer, Massive company uh, out, out of uh, Pennsylvania and down the coast there. But one of the things that he does all the time is he's involved in the community. He has yep. his turkey roast every Thanksgiving. He's a part of the Chamber of Commerce. He's he's in there volunteering and everything else. And, and that makes a difference because that name will carry. And yep. the best referral, the best, the lowest cost lead, we saw someone asking in, in there, Michael, about how to get more leads. This is where you start as a new yep. company. This is how you start it. Because your best leads are a referral. Your cheapest leads are your referrals. The most highly converted leads are referrals. So building that stuff out there and opening up your ability to be that neighborhood roofer is how you actually grow. Yeah, I want to I want to touch on that too just for a second to go back to a topic we were just speaking about about making sure that you're being friends or you're you're networking with people in your area. And, and Ty is one of my best friends in the world, as you know, Nick. And Speaking about Thai and people like Thai, there are people all over the country that run businesses as large as Thai's uh, company, but they're under the radar. And you wouldn't know that Thai Backer owns the roofing company. He owns the gutter company. He owns the siding company. He owns the landscape company as well to build houses from the ground up or restore them back to normal in that Delaware, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania market. And people like that or who you want to be friends with, because although, <laughs> like we were saying, you want to do the roof, you want to do the gutters, Ty doesn't care. Give them the siding, give them the, you know, those other things, but, but also, you know, um, make sure you're networking or learning from people like him. So what are some of the things that business owners, new business owners can do to set themselves up for success in their first couple of years? Uh, so uh, their first couple of years, they, they have to be driven with that process. They have to have, make sure that they're they're controlling the money properly uh, and properly sometimes meaning uh, means allowing somebody else to control it or, or, or be in charge of it. Um, but you have to have somebody strong that's saying no to you uh, on spending money for right now. Uh, making sure that you're you're buying the right equipment, the right uh, the right vehicles for your company. Making sure that you're you've got a hiring process in place where you're not just hiring warm bodies, but you're educating co- uh, competent people to go out and represent your brand. Um, the, it might sound like a lot to to do all of this, but if you're going to be a business owner and you want to last longer than the norm, which is two seasons. A roofing yeah. company does not last longer than two seasons, 99% of the time. That's like, you can ask Dimitri about that, right? You can ask anybody you want. But if you do not have your system set up uh, and you're not um, good with money, you're going to fail. Yeah. Making sure that you have an accounting ac- access to it, whether you have an accountant or you are recording everything in, in, in QuickBooks properly. Making sure that you're making sure that you know where your money is being spent at all times is important, which yep. also I think this brings it to the next point is and you kind of touched on it there, but I want to dive into it on a tech perspective yep. is controlling your output and your overhead. Yep. And you need to find tools that are going to be able to streamline you. Uh, I'm not going to give us a plug here. <laughs> but I'm not going to I swear well, but yeah exactly <laughs> but um, yeah, bro, find good. tools that are going to streamline you find tools that are going to help you out that are not going to yeah. drown you in multiple subscriptions now yeah. I'm going to say something that I think could be controversial with it you do not and I repeat you do not need a CRM in the first couple years you do not you are pushed to it uh, until you are to, at the point where you cannot track everything in your QuickBooks, in your uh, other programs like Roofer or something else like that, you you 
do not need a CRM because you're going to drown yourselves under the money unless there is a CRM out there that is made for your size of the company. Yeah. In, in, in my company, uh, speaking of that, uh, when a few years back, um, I'm not going to say what company we used for a CRM, but, but I've been through every CRM uh, that's out there. Uh, but one of the main ones was charging us an arm and a leg. And every time we would hire somebody new, we would have to pay that seat fee uh, or that, that extra user fee. And maybe that user doesn't last, but uh, three or four weeks. Now you just paid for a year of him to be on that mm -hmm. or her to be on that CRM. But yes, you don't need a CRM uh, to keep track of names, phone numbers, email addresses. Uh, you know, I used to use the paper folder. I don't suggest you use the paper folder anymore. Uh, they, they actually have really good online folders now. Uh, but you can uh, you can get away with not having all of that tech stack that you're talking about uh, uh, until you're ready for it. And the same thing when you're getting into uh, other things out there, making sure that you're 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 good with making the purchases on your your material that you're buying, yep. making sure that you get the good buying power from that right builder, uh, from the right building supplies place, uh, making sure that you're getting the right tools for the job too. Um, I know a lot of people dive in and trying to get like one of the coolest tools in my opinion out there is the uh, like equipter or something like that. That yeah. is things that you need to uh, get down in the future, sure. But making sure that you find the right disposal bins and partnerships with those people because you're going to be able, to, you don't want to drown yourself in there. And I actually want to uh, 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 talk about Rob Ryan's quote there. I'm not saying never get a CRM and not wait in yeah. like three or four years down the road, um, but making sure that it is a cost effective CRM that is suited for your company and your stage there. Because yep. you're right. The longer that you do that, uh, that you wait, it's going to be cost expensive to implement it. But there's a lot of people jumping in at elite enterprise CRMs out there that are unbelievable, but they are a brand new company. So it it, it really starts to 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 drive down, uh, drive bog you down, and you're only using a portion of that tool anyways. So it's be here, here's a better way to put it, Rob. The, the, thank you for bringing that up because I'm not saying don't ever use a CRM, especially since we're coming up with the CRM. But I'm saying more be aware of what you're using the CRM for and find the tool that's going to fit your needs. And that goes with even just regular tools, a quoting tool, a measuring tool and stuff. Find something that is going to fit your needs and your uh, a system. And Amanda, exactly right. To, to my point on the CRM earlier, QuickBooks can be used for a basic CRM for a brand new company because you could track customers and jobs and you can do invoicing there and you could pair it very well with an open API through Zapier with a lot of the tools out there. Let me let me dive into that real quick too about QuickBooks. Um, so when I first started World's Greatest Roofer, even though we weren't uh, an actual roofing company, we were selling materials, right? Um, the QuickBooks, we were using Excel spreadsheets and we were using Google Docs, uh, but we quickly found that uh, we needed uh, something like QuickBooks in order to implement, to send invoices, to also accept m large amounts of money uh, and then also keep track of not only our financials, but, but what it is that we were selling. So QuickBooks, yes, Amanda is very, very uh, comparable to, to something that you'll need in your business. Even if you do have a CRM, QuickBooks is still warranted. Yeah, and then even on that, Amanda brought up another good point. Amanda, you're on fire today, so great job. I'm glad Amanda's here. Um, air high five. And David Perry, I'm going to yeah. jump on this as well for you. And then also on, let me scroll up, Brandon. So, yes, a sales tool can be used to kind of mitigate this as well, as long as you make sure that that sales tool has an open API, like a Zapier that you could sync with QuickBooks so there's no double entry and nothing gets missed. So that's what I would really focus on. We're happy to help out here at Roofer for even just suggesting, and I will tag that at the end because there's an important part to it. But also sales tools, a lot of them can carry, like Roofer, can carry customers and jobs information through there as well. So it could be used as a starter system as well so that you can get measurements and quotes out. To answer the question on how does Roofer help financially on there, Roofer will drive down your cost for your tech stack because we include everything that you need to run a roofing business from instant estimator to measurements to jobs to customers to proposals with a nice sync with uh, uh, through Zapier with QuickBooks, all under one for a low cost. 
So when we're looking at everything here, you want to make sure that you guys are lean, that you guys have process, that you guys have information out there so that you know where to spend your money and you have your accounting lined in. And these are some of the things that new business owners can set themselves apart from the rest because TJ hit it right. And I'm going to call you out on one thing, TJ, because you did the Matt Radford thing and made up a number. But I actually know the number because I read it yesterday. What's that? Businesses in the first two years in roofing are 85% likely to close down. Oh, 85%. First, okay. And in the first five years, it's closer to 98. Mm, so maybe yeah. that's where I was at because it, it used to be five years. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying there. Um, yeah. You know what? Let, let's talk about that too, uh, about the financial situation. Mm -hmm. and, and let's uh, quickly talk about uh, how not to drown your roofing company um, un unnecessarily. Um, Amanda, you're here still in the comments um, and you'll hear me preach about it often. Most roofing companies out there in the real world have become marketing organizations, right? They're, they're doing really, uh, there's some, there's some great companies out there that are still only doing roofing, right? But most of the companies out there are, are becoming marketing organizations and they're, they're overwhelming themselves sometimes with the amount of sales that they're doing because they don't have the financial stability in order to build uh, in proper timelines uh, or to get suppliers to release that in that 30 for 30, you know, like if they, if they overspend their amount, they can't, uh, do anything until they pay off that next amount. So make sure that you're not overwhelming your staff. Um, make sure that you're uh, that you do have staff in place uh, that can help take on all of this new work that you might be getting. Uh, there's a company out there. I'm going to plug them uh, named Signs Global. That's one of Roofers Partners uh, that help people like myself who are really great at the sale but suck at the paperwork, you know, uh, or, or suck at, uh, go, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I, I suck at this, but like, maybe you don't have time to go get the permit. Maybe you don't have time to call for the dumpster. Maybe you don't have time uh, to, to be the accountant or, or uh, to get the referral, right? There, there are agencies or, or people out there that actually do that for people like myself and maybe you, uh, Nick, uh, who are great at that sales aspect, um, but need help getting it to the finish line. Um, and let's talk about uh, how to generate some more leads, if, if that's cool with you, Nick. Yeah, and there's a bunch of different mm -hmm. ways to generate more leads, because that was a couple comments up there that you saw in there as well. And, yeah. and, and leads is the biggest problem for 98% yeah. of the companies that are making up that yep. stat number, but it's super high. Uh, so one of the it, things that you can do is you can really start from a grassroots perspective. So it doesn't need to be a system where you're paying for leads, you're paying for this. Really yeah. start, and we talked about the neighborhood roofer thing, but start by identifying, number one, what your ideal customer profile is, yep. your ICP. Is it, like, are you a metal guy that's only doing standing scene that you're really focusing on the high end homes? Are you working on Euro Shield where you know that you're looking at like more the higher price points? Or are you going to be looking at like shingles, flat roofs, and all that stuff? Yep. Once you find out your ICP, find out how the best way to market to them is not by paid ads off the bat. Paid ads will come later, but start figuring out how you could organically do it networking yep. events, door knocking, door hangers going out the chat there and everything, you can get that information out. One of the best ways I've seen is people using QR codes. Oh my yep. God, my background is taking over my card, but putting <laughs> a call to actions on everything that yep. you hand out. So whether it's a door hanger, whether it's a business card, having a QR code to drive people back to having something on your website to entice them to talk to you. Yeah. There's a lot, TJ, you said it at the beginning, there's a lot of roofs out there. Yeah, a lot of roofs out there to work with. You, you know, um, you know this, Nick. You you hang around me enough, and, and then also other people from Roofer who've been around me know that every time that I'm in a in a grocery store or I'm in a restaurant, uh, one of the first things that I always ask the person that I'm speaking with is, "Hey, are you on social media?" And uh, and you, you know, people might th think of that as being vain. When uh, the next thing out of my mouth is, "Is like, hey." Why don't you follow me? 
Yeah. And, uh, and it's but, so good. I love it yeah, every time. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, you know, it's so easy yeah. for you to get that waiter or the, or the wait staff or, or somebody in a grocery store, you walk up, Hey, you know, uh, I'm sorry to bother you right now. Here's my business card. Uh, do, do you know who I am? Uh, oh, do you follow me on social? Oh no. Oh, you don't. Oh, here's my card. Um, you know, if you ever want to follow me, here's all my information, but then that, that gives you the groundwork for now. Okay. This person might go home. They might follow you or they might watch your content and see that you're actually uh, a good person or a good roofer or somebody trustworthy to them. Um, but there's so many methods out there to get leads right now for free versus paying for them that although they might seem like old, uh, old ways of, of uh, lead generation, they're still very much valuable. Being a part of the neighborhood app, uh, being a part of uh, all social media platforms. Like you were saying earlier, there's groups in all of the areas, like there's groups all over Aurora, Colorado here. Uh, I know that there's groups up in Northern Colorado for very small towns that have less than 10,000 people. Uh, you join those groups, join those chambers of commerce. Uh, you know, I'm going to say something that a lot of people don't like, but you should join the BBB. Um, the Better Business Bureau, although people have their own thoughts about it, uh, it's still very much uh, looked at in the United States. Although roofers might not agree with that, there, there are people that still will swear by the BBB as giving them great uh, recognition uh, and leads. But make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, that you're not overspending on lead generation. I've had an opportunity to work with marketing agencies in the past that have drowned me financially uh, because I gave them uh, the checkbook and said, hey, go get me leads. And uh, come to find out $20,000 later after a weekend uh, and no leads produced, uh, I was $20,000 in the hole. So make sure that the people that you're working together with, you're setting the proper expectations um, with your marketing agencies. Uh, and then also you're getting what they're expecting out of the money that you're spending with them. Exactly. And that's important to take a look at. There's a lot of people who are, are worried about pairing themselves with different tools out there like a BBB or even the Angie list or anything else like that. Your name in more areas makes you more reputable. Yeah. So put yourself out there and open it up and be able to improve that flow because those are the things that are able to open, open up the doors for you more often. So bring in leads through social, bring it through organic services before you start paying for it. Find ways that you can entice people with your personality, with your offerings and what you can do and let that word take over. One of the greatest ways I've seen it be uh, done is in-person testimonials after every job. Just ask them like, hey, like with the camera on, hey, do you feel comfortable with me uh, filming you? It's like, hey, I'm with Mrs. Jones here. We just finished up her roof here. Can you tell about your experience? Quick 20 second video. That's cat catnip to other homeowners. They wanna see not what you're saying all the time, but what other homeowners are saying like that, yeah. that they're gonna be asking for it. You know, um, every single person that's watching this live broadcast has a camera right now on their phone. And, uh, and they should be out there um, when they're on roofs. Uh, if you're not comfortable in front of that camera, the camera goes both ways. Point it at what you're looking at, but show people why it is that you're an expert in your area um, and, and why you deserve their business. Um, but like you're saying, put your business out there to everybody uh, so that, that they can trust you and, and they're gonna keep calling you. Um, now, Although the, you might not have a social media presence right now, and maybe you don't understand how to grow one, it's very simple. You have to learn how to be consistent with your posting uh, and uh, in showing people what it is that you want to see uh, or what they would want to see. Uh, make sure that, um, that whatever it is that you're doing, that it includes some sort of short form videos. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to plug myself here at Roofer real quick in regards to building a following. Um, when I came to Roofer, Roofer had a great following on their social platforms, on Facebook and Instagram, uh, and a couple, you know, YouTube had started to take it off. But just on the TikTok alone, uh, Astawa had done a great job of getting that started. But we've grown just over 11,000 new followers in 90 days. 
just by posting short form videos on that on that platform. On Facebook, in the past 90 days, we've grown just over 1,100 new followers. Tick, uh, I think you saw YouTube. I, I shared it to you yesterday. YouTube, we just went over 1,100 followers this morning. Uh, so as long as you're being consistent, you're posting great content, and great content is showing people what you want them to see. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're a roofer, show them a roof. <laughs> and, show, like, and then tell them why you're the best. But, but you don't have to be an infomercial. Um, my catchphrase or what I tell people all the time is be an influencer, not an infomercial. Because if you're influencing people the way that you want, you're not selling them anything because they already like you. They're going to yeah. buy from you uh, as long as it as they don't feel like they're being pushed into a sale. Yeah, exactly. And these things are a big, big thing to kind of open it up. So right. I know that we're, uh, we're we're coming up in into the end of the time there. But yeah. uh, let's just uh, give a quick little wrap up here um, for everybody that were. Thank you for joining. Thank you for uh, 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 chatting with us in, in the chat there. It was on fire today. Thanks, Anna, Amanda. Uh, Rob and everybody else in here, Aram. Uh, so really appreciate you guys. If you have any other questions, please hit us up. Do not hesitate. I, uh, my email is nic at roofer.com. So it's nick at roofer.com. And uh, TJ, you're yeah, TJ yeah. at roofer.com. Can I, can I say one thing before, go we, before we go? Um, every single one of us has a responsibility to the roofing community to, to make sure that you're doing right by your homeowners, your clients, as well as your employees. Uh, please make sure that you're always taking that step to show that positivity and the love to each one of those people and, and do right by all of them. Um, in, in regards to social media content, make sure that you're putting out good content that's that's people can uh, relate to uh, and, and just be yourself. Yeah. Uh, but make sure that that you're respectfully representing the roofing industry. There's been so many people out there that hate roofers or hate construction workers because of many, many years of bad, bad taste in everybody's mouth with the way that people are treated. So just make sure that you're you're doing right by others. Yeah. And, and, and really kind of like make sure you're in it for the right reasons. And to David's point here, this roofer offer consulting for new startups. Uh, here's something that's really uh, not known well about Roofer, but our onboarding is free and with onboarding comes customer success. And yeah, yeah. we talk to hundreds and hundreds of roofers. Of people. TJ and I don't know all of this stuff just because we were in it. It's because we talk to hundreds of contractors a week. So hit us up, David, hit up your, your account manager. We're here to help out every step of the way and uh, go through everything but uh, we really appreciate you guys all coming out and joining us uh, TJ that was a screaming success process yeah. Pete we miss you we'll see you on the next master class uh, but thanks again everybody don't uh, forget rise is coming to a city near you but I'm that's, that's right. you didn't hear that from me just uh, we'll we'll just keep your ear out guys for rise David Perry uh, there might may or may not be a bunch of cities that we're hitting up and we'll be doing a lot of this in-person consulting with the great partners of ours as well so uh, thank you guys thanks everybody have a good one